All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session this afternoon on liberation from mechanical ventilation. Uh, my name is Ewan Gallagher from the University of Toronto. My uh, pleasure to co-chair with Professor Alexandre de Moule from uh, Paris, because I can't say the full name of the university. Sorbonne University. Ah, that I can say. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, uh, it's our pleasure that we have a great uh, lineup of, of speakers this afternoon, and uh, um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium uh, Dr. Lise Picu from Lausanne University to address the epidemiology of difficult weaning. Thanks a lot for this introduction. These are my disclosures, nothing related to this presentation. Then, what is weaning? Weaning is the global process that enables us to separate our patients from their ventilator. And of course, it's important to shorten mechanical ventilation and to be efficient with weaning. Why? But obviously, being invasively ventilated means staying in the ICU. This is not really very good for the patient, and uh, this also uh, needs uh, to have enough beds. And being invasively ventilated is uncomfortable for the patient. It's associated with complications and also with long-term sequelae. And probably even much more importantly, the longer the duration of the mechanical ventilation, the worse the survival. And this is true, whatever the reason of intubation. Then, before going to epidemiological data, I would like to underline some important points that were mentioned by a group of experts that wrote the consensus conference on weaning a long time ago, but this is still the most recent conference consensus on the topic we have. And the experts said that weaning should be considered as early as possible, already in 2007. They already proposed a classification according to the difficulty of weaning. And they propose simple, difficult, and prolonged weaning. And to go into one of these classifications, it was needed to have at least one spontaneous breathing trial. And finally, they underlined in this paper that there is one step, one kind of milestone that probably is important in the weaning process, and this step is a spontaneous breathing trial because this is a diagnostic test to assess whether uh, a patient can breathe without the support of the mechanical ventilator. And in this consensus conference, it was clearly explained and underlined that weaning is a step-by-step -step process. Then first, the patient is able to breathe spontaneously. We have to detect that. Then the patient should have what we call readiness to win criteria, which have to be identified to go to the next step, that is, in this consensus conference, the spontaneous breathing trial. One, if winning is easy, or more, if winning is more difficult. And then the patient has extubation criteria, if yes, can be extubated, and if he doesn't need to be reintubated, we can say he is wind. And successful extubation is defined as being extubated without being reintubated within the next two or sometimes seven days. There is not a definitive consensus on that in the literature. Something that is very important, and I'm going to come back to that later, is that already in 2007, based on uh, the data they had at that time, they mentioned that 68.8% of the ventilated patients could finally be weaned with success. You are going to see that this number has not changed a lot today. Then, 
When we speak about epidemiology of winning, we have to discuss the result of three important observational trials published uh, some years ago. First, the WIN study, then what I'm going to call the JAMA study, which was published in 2021, and finally, the biggest of those observational studies, which is the WINSAFE study that was published last year. There is already something that is important to underline, and it is that the inclusion criteria for those three observational studies were not exactly the same. For the WIN study, all intubated patients were included. For the JAMA study, at least 24 hours of mechanical ventilation was required for inclusion, and for the WINSAFE study, two days of mechanical ventilation, at least, were needed. Then, what about the WIN study? Big observational study, three months of data collection, all intubated patients included, 36 ICU, mainly in France, but also in Spain and one in Switzerland, and 2,709 patients included. You can see in this table with the general patient characteristics that the patients that were included are very common ICU patients, the one we have every day. And you can observe that the median duration of mechanical ventilation in this cohort was four days. Among this cohort, 60.9% of the patients could be win and were alive when they went out the intensive care unit. Nearly the same value as what was published in the consensus conference a long time ago. And very importantly, when we tried to classify the patient of this cohort in simple, difficult or prolonged winning according to uh, the uh, consensus conference, we saw that half of them could just not be classified. Why? Because half of them never had an SBT, either because they died before entering into the winning process, or because they were never successfully freely wind, or maybe because they were extubated without having a previous SBT. Based on this consideration, the classification was modified a bit and the fourth group was added. And these four groups is the group of the patients who never had an SBT. The other groups are very similar to the previous classification. Simple winning when a patient can be weaned within one day after the first separation attempt. Separation attempt defined either as a spontaneous breathing trial or as a direct extubation without previous SBT. And in this first group, simple winning, you can see that you can find 57% uh, of the patients who entered in the winning process. Then we have the second group, which is the difficult winning. And those patients are those who can be wind within two and seven days after the first uh, separation attempt. And this represents 10.1% of the patients who entered into the winning phase. And finally, for the patients for who you need more than seven days to separate them from the ventilator, uh, starting from uh, the, the first uh, separation attempt, prolonged winning, you can see that uh, this is nearly nine, but only nine percent of our patients. Very importantly, you can see that the mortality according to those different groups are very different. Around six percent for simple winning, 17 percent for difficult winning, and 30 percent for prolonged winning. And even more importantly, if you look at the probability of death, you can see that for each additional day spent on the ventilator after the first winning attempt, separation attempt, you have a huge increase in the probability of death. When the patient enters in the group two, difficult winning, 90% of death probability, 10 days later, 36.8% of 
of death probability. Then the JAMA study. Again, a big observational study, patient ventilator during at least one day, 142 ICUs, 90 countries, six regions in the world, and 1,868 patients included. One of the very important information we get from this study is that 22.7 patients were extubated without previous SBT. This, for me, is a big surprise. I didn't think that real life was that, like that. Importantly, eight patients were tracheostomized without having an SBT before, and 49.8% only of all the cohorts had an SBT. And if we look at the first SBT, a bit more than 20% of the patients succeed this first SBT, and around 19% of the patients had SBT failure. And if we look at the outcome of those patients who failed the first SBT, you can see that compared to the patient who succeed, the patients who failed the first SBT has a longer ICU length of stay and increased mortality. The authors looked at the factors that were associated with this failure at the first SBT, and they found that higher respiratory surface score was associated with an increased risk of failure, that more sedation was associated with an increased risk of failure, and that the fact of not being hospitalized in a unit with a protocol to adjust the ventilator settings was also associated with an increased risk of failure at this first SBT. And then we have the WinSafe study, which is the biggest of the three observational studies, one month data collection, invasive ventilation more than two days, this time 481 ICUs in 50 countries and 5,869 patients included. The first outcome, primary outcome of this study was the percentage of patients who could be successfully weaned. And it's 65%, nearly the same value as we had in the previous trial. In this cohort, at least one separation attempt was performed in 77.1% of the patient. And this first separation attempt was mainly SBT, 66%, but also again, direct extubation without previous SBT in 20.5% of the patient. This was a big surprise. And direct tracheostomy, 13.5% of the patients. And if we now look at those patients who had at least one separation attempt, and we classify again based on the duration of the winning process starting from this point of the first separation attempt. You can see that easy winning, short winning, 64.8% of the patient, intermediate winning within one week, 10.1% of the patient, and prolonged winning, 9.6. Then overall, 20% of the patient, about 20%, are not easy to win. What is very interesting in this study is that we have all the time of the different milestones of weaning. And it was possible to look at the delays between the milestones. And what is represented here by the black arrow is the delay between the time when the readiness for winning, the readiness criteria for winning were met and the time of the first spontaneous breathing trial. As you can see, there is a delay. And this delay in median was quite short, about one day, but very importantly, 22.4% of the patient had a delay from winning eligibility to first separation attempt of more than five days. And this is a lot. And even more importantly, the time interval 
from the presence of the winning eligibility criteria to the first separation attempt was independently associated with winning failure. And winning failure means difficult winning, and difficult winning is associated with increased in mortality. What were the factors associated with winning delay? Then some of those factors are related to the patient, frailty before IC1 mission, being admitted for a traumatic disease, and having a high SOFA score. This cannot really be changed, but we can be aware of that. What can be changed, and this is much more important, is that the presence of the winning delay was associated with the use of continuous neuromuscular blockers and with the use of sedation, especially of deep sedation. And that we can definitely improve by improving our practice. Then as take home messages, I would say once again that winning is a step-by-step -step process, that some steps, and we know that from the observational studies, are not always done in real life, then maybe they could be omitted in some patients, and this is going to be discussed later in this session. Overall, 65% of the patients can be weaned successfully. When weaning is initiated, about 20% of the patients are difficult to wean. Non-simple weaning is associated with increased mortality, and delays in the weaning process are associated with more winning failure. And I would like to conclude by saying that proactivity and rapidity is essential for winning. And we know that from those observational studies. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the floor? Maybe I'll take this opportunity to ask, do you, how often do you think that the use of deep sedation that we're seeing, for example, in the Wien Safe study is truly modifiable? You know, some of these patients are genuinely difficult to manage because of agitated delirium and so on. And is there any signal in the data to determine whether, you know, this is unnecessary deep sedation versus necessary deep sedation? No question that sedation delays liberation from mechanical ventilation, but to what extent is it, in fact, modifiable? Very practically, I can answer that deep sedation is probably uh, always too much sedation, at least very deep sedation. The very deep sedation is needed in the very early phase. But then, at least in my experience, we uh, don't really decrease sedation very fast. And this is definitely unnecessary sedation. The only way to know is to try to reduce sedation, but very proactively. Yes, uh, Arnaud Thiel from France. Thank you, Liz. Uh, just a comment for the win classification. Uh, the problem, in my opinion, is that classification um, is needed after the winning process. Patients are classified after the winning process, and it cannot predict the risk of extubation failure, for example, and therefore it's interesting, but not to predict the future, maybe to predict the past, but it's easier. And, um, and for example, it's well illustrated in the JAMA paper. In the JAMA paper, uh, the risk of reintubation is not increased in patients who failed the first winning trial failure, winning trial, as compared to those who succeeded the first spontaneous breathing trial. And therefore, it's interesting, but uh, um, patients are classified at ICU discharge, and, and it's, uh, it's just a panorama, but not, uh, we have to keep in mind, it's not to, to predict. Uh, do you? I perfectly agree. And this is the limitation of the observational studies. Uh, we can generate hypotheses. We can test to find factors that are correlated with some groups of patients. But then we should test prospectively by uh, modifying those factors that can be modified to see whether we can decrease the number of difficult winning, for example. Yes, but the previous study uh, using the, the old classification um, attempt to, 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 to compare patients according to the time of winning and not 
taking into account the result of extubation. And for example, the study by Fung, Penuelas, etc., etc., um, compared patients with a, a winning process of 24 hours, uh, difficult winning, prolonged winning, but without taking into account the result of extubation. And, and therefore, this classification, in, in my opinion, more useful to predict but it, it's, it's different of classification to predict or to have a, a general panorama. Yeah, in fact, the definition of extubation failure was very different in the first classification and the next one, for sure, not seven days. And this is a problem for the WIND study. But it was uh, 24 or 48 hours. Then it's also uh, post uh, classification, but shorter period. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, thank you very much. So, this is uh, my pleasure to uh, call our next uh, speaker, Victoria McCready from the University of Toronto, Canada. Thanks very much. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me here today to talk about liberation from mechanical ventilation in a specific group in an acute brain injury. And I have no relevant conflicts of interest for this talk. So uh, acute brain injury patients are very different. I'm sure we all say that of our own subspecialties, but I'm going to try and convince you. Uh, compared to general ICU, the indications to actually mechanically ventilate them are usually very different. We're trying to protect the airway, uh, consider preventing hypoxemia and hypercapnia. We know that they are uh, mechanically ventilated for much longer than our general ICU population, higher rates of VAP, <coughs> and the expiration failure rates are also very high. So general ICU, I'd probably quote around 10 to 15 percent, but then for um, neuro ICU uh, 15, and actually more recent data shows up to 29% for extubation failure. And we also see an increase in the delayed extubations and higher rates of tracheostomy and overall higher mortality. So we're talking about a, a pretty different group here. And then how do I think about getting them from liberation? Um, this is not new to you, but I maybe point out things like sedation awakening trials. We probably in your ICU more likely to think about neurological wake up tests because we think we're maybe lightening up the sedation, but we're trying to wake them up from their comatose state because they have a primary brain injury. The SPT, and I'm going to talk about the caveats there about the daily screening. And then airway, I'm not going to be talking about cuff leak, I'm actually just talking about airway protective reflexes to try and get us to an extubation trial. We may go through this pathway and still decide that we feel uncomfortable and do a, a direct or primary tracheostomy. And as I said, our rates are much higher than the general ICU. But overall, we're trying to weigh up this avoid prolonging uh, translaryngeal intubation versus unnecessary tracheostomies. But if we pull the tube soon, too soon, we may contribute to that higher extubation failure rate that you saw and reintubations. Uh, but if we wait too long and go to a tracheostomy, we may also contribute to the higher rates of tracheostomy that you see. So when we talk about a neurological wake-up test, I tend to think about three main organ systems, and I think about here about the brain. And there's some really nice small single center data from Marcus Scoglin and Raymond Helbock from his uh, fellowship in Columbia, where it showed that neurological wake-up tests were consistently shown to induce a stress reaction with increased heart rate, blood pressure, ICP, a drop in cerebral perfusion pressure, and some differential results for brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral mycodialysis, but a concern to us. And so in addition to the general ICU patient um, indications, I don't wake up people in status, epilepticus, uh, intracranial hypertension, and ones that I am actively trying to monitor their temperature. If we move on to SBT, now I'm thinking about lungs. You know, Compared to the prior epidemiological data, and unfortunately most brain injury patients were not included in any of the general ICU big papers about SATs and SBTs, um, the one thing I want to point out here is the daily screening. And so I'm going to go back to Wes Eli's paper, so his trial from the New England in the 1990s. And this was modified criteria from Martin Tobin, where they had actually looked at a, a daily screening and an SBT in a trial. And most of these are cardiorespiratory variables, but I just highlighted the one about addressing or looking at adequate cough, which I think has fallen off at least our local protocol, but was in that original data there. And what we really want to answer is, is how well does this work for our uh, neuro ICU patients? And this is an, a nice work from uh, Richard Coe and colleagues. It's back in 2009, but they were actually saying, okay, let's take all these parameters, respiratory mechanics, and look at them between failed and successful extubations. And we can see that there was no difference in either of these fails. So it did not predict failure of extubation. And that's usually because our, most of our patients pass SBTs, their respiratory mechanics are pretty good, and it's all about airway and brain failure.
And so the same group Wes Eli now led, or the main author was Andrew Neyman, uh, went to look on and see if there's some neuro modifications that need to be made for that daily screening. And there was two main indications. The first one I think is the most important, which is to think about in the intervention group, they added in, if they had an ICP monitor, they did not undergo an SBT. I think that's a little bit prohibitive, and I would say that at least in the modern era, we do not, um, not do SBT, a double negative there, but sorry, I'll phrase that a better way. If they have an IC monitor in, I would still do an SBT, but I would uh, consider looking at whether I thought they were uh, concerned about intracranial hypertension. The second one, I think, is more about ownership. It was uh, more in the open ICU era when neurosurgeons were the, the attending MDs, and they were given the ultimate decision about extubation, mechanical ventilation modes, and uh, whether to discharge. And so this really came up for us when, uh, so a, a big uh, RCT in Canada, NeuroETT led by Damon Scales and Neil Ferguson, was looking at uh, a pathway of trying to extubate patients, neuropatients, um, onto high flow nasal cannula when they met readiness criteria versus usual care. And we were finding all these people we thought would get in were not getting into the study and realized that when, what was happening was they were just never going forward for SBTs. And we had a local uh, guideline which said uh, we had put in for at least at our hospital uh, ICP controlled. And we realized that the RTs were interpreting this as if you ever see an ICP monitor, it means there's intracranial hypertension and please do not proceed. Do not pass go and collect your $200. So all these people were not getting their SBTs. And so we just broke this down a little and, and tried to make it better for our, at least our local centers and within that trial context to say we're looking for ICP stability and we're looking for GCS stability. But I think that's a little loss when we think about our general ICU daily screening and the fact that, as I said, all of neuropatients have been excluded from a lot of these uh, big seminal studies. So if we move on from SPT and now look at the airway, and as I said, I'm not going to talk about cuff leak, it's more about airway protective reflexes. Um, this is some older data from our group in the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, but I think it's still very relevant. Um, it's a multi-centre study looking at uh, just under 200 patients and looking at, prospectively, how we move forward in trying to get them to wean and then liberate. And then we looked at factors associated with extubation. I'll point out here that GCS motor, right, I think we, we all know GCS total doesn't really work because the verbal is always underappreciated or is at least incorrect in our brain and our patients. So we should always only look at the subscale and motor is the most prognostic. Showed that there was no difference. And that's important because a lot of smaller single centers before had shown differential results for GCS. Uh, but what was significant was cough. Um, and then actually gag was not entirely significant, but you might tell yourself it was moving towards significance. So our airway protective reflexes. And then we also looked at, uh, so what, why don't we just hold on and delay? And you can see here that GCS is significant. So I think as physicians, we see an impaired a GCS and we hold off. Um, and we are also thinking about cough as well there. Sorry, I just missed that. But it does impact our decision making on when we decide to take the tube out. Uh, definitely subjectively, we look at the GCS. And so this leads on to um, consensus recommendations back in 2020 that we did with uh, Chiara Roba and Robert Stevens led, trying to come up with some particular liberation, well, general mechanical ventilation, but also liberation guidelines for weaning in just brain injury patients. And we came up with the, the level of recommendation to strongly recommend considering these four factors, one being airway protective reflexes, as well as um, level of consciousness. But uh, as a group decided not to go on and actually do a meta-analysis in this, so there was no evidence for either airway protective reflexes and level of consciousness and unable to provide a specific GCS threshold to extubate these patients. Moving on from that, um, we did a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is led by Sharia Taran, who's a, a very bright young researcher within our group who's doing a PhD in this area. And we took all of those studies, 21 studies and just over 3,000 patients to look at factors associated with extubation. And we find that age you can do nothing about and duration of mechanical ventilation, again, that's probably within your power somewhat, but again found that airway protective reflexes were really uh, important here when we think about extubating. And so GCS, uh, either extubation or the motor score was not significant when we consider it extubation failure. And so this leads me on to really the biggest epidemiological study that we have in brain injury patients, uh, led by Raphael Sanotti. Um, and this was published, although before our meta-analyses, our data collection had, had not included this because it had stopped data collection before. So it's not in that meta-analyses I just showed you. 
But this large prospective study, we did 73 ICUs, 18 countries, and over 1,500 patients. And the primary outcome was really to try and predict uh, extubation outcome by five days. And we included 1,500 patients and we um, had about 1,100 or 1,200 had an extubation attempt. You can see that high rate of primary or direct tracheostomy, and we had a 19% overall uh, extubation failure rate. And I've just pointed out, we looked at the national averages, and so the national uh, rates of extubation failure went from 0%, and those were really centres that had only recruited one or two people, up to 29%. Um, and again, that was the 29% was not in centers or countries that had only done one or two, and it was just uh, a, a, a obscure finding. The, those were countries that had a lot of patients enrolled in this study. The why, at least when we observe, why do we go direct to primary tracheostomy? It seems to be those who have severe neurological impairment, uh, airway impairment, and this includes a polytrauma, so those with face and neck trauma. And then just, I think, importantly to highlight, um, from why do people fail? So you'll work out here that the percentages are more than 100%. And um, that's just to say you could have a couple of reasons. So I think what's happening here was we were reporting they may have had respiratory failure with coexistent neurological failure, which to my mind, uh, at least uh, me mechanistically, would fit with how I see these patients fail. They've got a lower GCS, the mucus plug, they have a desaturation event and respiratory failure and subsequent HAPR-VAP. The main uh, goal of this study was to try and create a, a extubation success prediction score. And so the actual main one was 20 variables, which seemed too complicated. And we looked at a seven simplified score. And I'm not showing you this to go and take home and start calculating the points here. The training cohort was pretty good, but the, the external, the validation cohort, the, the ROC area under the curve was, I think, 0.62, so really not so good. But it was more just to highlight, again, what is significantly impacting our extubation success in at least this large epidemiological study. And again, we can see airway reflexes. You might say, but Vicky, there's a GCS motor six there included. You know, sure, if they're a GCS motor six, so they're perfect, yes, that's not. But I think um, you lose by dichotomizing GCS to GCS six versus nothing, or five, four, three, two, one. And you, our brain and your patients, they're hardly ever a GCS6. They're never going to look like a rose. They're always going to have some neurological impairment. So I, I don't think that is that applicable. So you might say, let's just press pause. Like, why don't we just wait? Uh, we did look at some of this in our data, very small numbers, but at least we can say, okay, the ones that have failed extubation do worse. Why don't we just wait while well, those that we compare from prompt versus delayed, the delayed extubation group had a higher mortality. And we went on to subsequently say, well, why don't we compare those that failed extubation uh, versus primary tracheostomy? And there was no difference. So to me, this data leads me to say, I usually, in my practice, would give people a trial of extubation. I don't delay if they've met readiness criteria. Or up front, like we're seeing in the data, I'm going to make a judgment call um, that I think that their neurological impairment is too severe, and I'm not going to put them at risk of airway uh, or obstruction when I pull the tube out. Uh, looking at ENEO, so much bigger data, there's a little bit we can pull out and look at primary tracheostomy. And again, I think inherently, the people that we decide to do a primary trach or direct trach are different. So they were mostly people that had very severe neurological impairment. Um, they all had a higher risk of HAP, uh, increased duration of mechanical ventilation, length of stay, and higher mortality. Interestingly, no, no change in withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. Um, I think sometimes we think that, again, when we look at timing of trach trials, thinking about cohort data is uh, self-fulfilling prophecies and residual confounding with decisions that we make either to or not to do tracheostomy because we think we're going to withdraw. So if I was to sum up all of this data, I would say that extubation failure is very high in our brain injury patients, but delaying extubation uh, is not associated with an improved outcome. I think waiting for a full neurological recovery is not mandatory and it's not feasible. And that thinking about airway protective reflexes are very important. And really, future study should think about the optimal timing and selection of those that may benefit from a primary tracheostomy. I don't think we fully understand that data yet. Um, and deserves uh, further studies. So I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity and any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh
the communication is, is open discussion. So are we, we have questions. I see that we have questions here in the front. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. I'm curious, your um, model with the limited seven variables didn't perform so well, you mentioned, uh, in the validation set. Was there any thought to, or what do you guys think about going back to the full sort of, you said 20 or 21 variables, or are, were there specific variables outside of that that might be pulled in to improve the, the, uh, um, the discriminatory capacity of that model? Yeah, I mean, I, I might leave, uh... Uh, Dr. Sonotti to, to answer that one if you're seeing the hallway. I, you know, for me, predictive indices, and I just think they're never perfect. And uh, trying to individualize when we take all these big um, impact, like for me, at least in TBI, I think of crash and impact calculators and how wrong they can be. And so I think they're really great to understand what went into the model. You either do or do not understand regression modeling and how people got to that answer, but at least you can understand they're significant. And I think about those factors when I'm making my decisions at the bedside. Um, What's well, not to say that there will not be some AI algorithm for weaning in the future. I'm pretty sure there will be. Will we understand it? Probably not. Thank you. I would like to ask a very simple question from Portugal. How do you measure cough reflex? Yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, and it it uh, depends. So they're, they're, um, in the interest of time, I took out some slides, but I now see that I was a little bit short, so maybe I could have added it in. But there was a nice uh, study looking at semi-quantitative cough, um, and so semi-quantitative because they had, I think, created a four-point scale, and it was just really about whether it was induced. So I think the, the big thing is to think about, do you have a spontaneous cough? So someone who has secretions going down their ETT, they detect it and they cough, uh, simultaneously or spontaneously. Um, or what gets me very worried, so I always ask our nursing team is, um, was it induced? I.e., did you have to put your inline catheter down and go down a couple of times? And then, yes, there was a uh, uh. Uh, And so when people say there's a cough, just like when people say there's a cuff leak, I tend to say, like, uh, how, why? How did you get that? Um, and so I, I don't think we have a perfect way of quantifying this, but at least this, uh, I can't remember, sorry, the lead author of that study, but it was at least a great attempt to try and quantify cough when we're trying to study it in like the ENEO study so that we can all be talking the same language. And I'm not sure we're quite there yet, talking the same way when we talk about cough. Other, other questions? So uh, I'm going to just take one. Um, so. In the same same practical question, uh, how do you assess uh, swallowing? Because I find it's very difficult when there is the, the tube. So practically at bedside, how, how do you do? Yeah, I, again, uh, there was, I think it was the Neyman study. There's been a couple of groups who have tried to objectively within their um, studies say how they did it. Um, and some of them are much more elaborate than I would say I do at the bedside. Um, I usually take a yanker and at least try to stimulate the posterior and look at the, the, the soft palate and then go back to the uvula and do cross the midline um, and then look for thyroid cartilage um, upward movement. Um, but there has been much more complicated ways of people assessing swallowing in some of those studies that I quoted. Um, but that's at least my bedside assessment of it. Other questions? Great, thank you very much. It's uh, our pleasure to invite uh, Professor Arnaud Thier from uh, Poitiers, France to present, to ask the question, is there still a place for spontaneous breathing trials? Thank you, it's a very great pleasure to participate at this session. Um, my name is Arnaud Thiel. I work at the University Hospital of Poitiers in France, and my talk concerns the usefulness of uh, spontaneous breathing trials. Um, these are my conflicts of interest, mainly with uh, Fisher and Bagel. So the question is whether performing spontaneous breathing trials uh, still have a place. This is the question, and uh, this is my response. Yes, obviously. Um, why perform a spontaneous breathing trial before extubation? Uh, 
First, to mimic physiological conditions after extubation by performing either a TP trial by disconnecting the patient from the ventilator, or with low levels of pressure support ventilation, usually ranging from five to eight centimeters of water. And the question, is my patient able to breathe without the ventilator? And with the final objective of decreasing the risk of reintubation, because reintubation in this setting is the main patient-centered outcome after extubation. Usual reintubation rates are around 15% in ICUs, as indicated by orange bars. But mortality in case of reintubation is particularly high, reaching 30%. And therefore, reintubation is clearly the, the main objective prevent, avoid reintubation. Why decide extubation without spontaneous breathing trial? Because it's true that some patients may be successfully extubated despite spontaneous breathing trial failure. And the sensitivity of this test is not necessarily uh, very high. It's not to save time by avoiding the trial, the, the trial because it lasts 30 minutes to two hours. But to hasten extubation and shorten duration of mechanical ventilation. But first, this outcome is probably of lower importance than reintubation. This is a study comparing direct extubation without spontaneous breathing trial versus conventional winning. Nine ICUs, 130 IC, uh, patients in Italy intubated at least 48 hours. A high proportion of postoperative patients, usually patients at low risk of extubation failure, ready for a spontaneous breathing trial, and they were extubated without spontaneous breathing trial and received systematic non-invasive ventilation to facilitate winning. The duration of mechanical ventilation was shortened with this strategy. Without increased risk of reintubation, which was relatively low, 5-10% in both groups. But first, it was only significant in postoperative patients. And second, the duration of mechanical ventilation, including invasive and non-invasive ventilation, did not significantly differ between both groups. Maybe extubation despite spontaneous breathing trial failure, as illustrated in these randomized control trials performed in United Kingdom, 41 ICUs, more than 300 patients intubated at least 48 hours, and extubated despite spontaneous breathing trial failure and receiving non-invasive ventilation after extubation to facilitate winning. Again, the duration of mechanical ventilation, including invasive and um, non-invasive ventilation did not significantly differ. But to, to trust this strategy first, reintubation rates must not be higher than with the conventional um, extubation because this is again the main patient-centered outcome. And as you can see, uh, reintubation rates were particularly high in both groups, uh, 29 in the conventional group and 37 in the interventional group. In my opinion, this is an unacceptable uh, reintubation rate in, an, in ICUs. The difference was 8%, and again, this difference is relatively high, but not significant, probably because it was underpowered to, um, uh, uh, to show a significant difference between the two groups. And for example, in this study, when we compared the use of prophylactic non-invasive ventilation versus high flow nasal oxygen in patients at high risk of extubation failure to prevent reintubation, we observed reintubation rates below 20%. And especially, we found a significant difference with only an absolute difference of 6%. Therefore, extubation despite spontaneous breathing trial failure Probably this strategy may be discussed in patients highly selected. And I do that maybe twice a year, mainly in patients, in COPD patients with chronic hypoxemia, and mainly, in my opinion, in hypoxemic patients, patients who failed spontaneous breathing trial due to hypoxemia without clinical signs of respiratory distress, because I know that after extubation, I can provide high FiO2 using high flow nasal oxygen or non-invasive ventilation. But 
In my opinion, it cannot be recommended as a daily practice. Um, but um, extubation, direct extubation is uh, uh, usually do, as uh, um, uh, Liz uh, showed in the previous slide. In this observational study, in nearly 2,000 patients in many ICUs, many countries, after um, excluding patients who died uh, without winning and uh, who were directly tracheostomized, um, a majority of patients had spontaneous breathing trial, but uh, more than 20% of patients were directly extubated without spontaneous breathing trial. And these patients had shorter duration of mechanical ventilation and lower mortality as compared to patients who had, who underwent a spontaneous breathing trial. But I think probably it's more uh, not the consequence of direct extubation, but the reason. And these patients were probably extubated without spontaneous breathing trial because they had short duration of mechanical ventilation and were probably at low risk of extubation failure. And they were younger than the other patients. Um, they were more frequently postoperative patients known to have um, lower risk of extubation failure, and they were less frequently intubated for acute respiratory failure, a condition associated with uh, difficult winning. But when we perform spontaneous breathing trial, all spontaneous breathing trials are not the same. And this is the patient effort increasing when switching from assist control ventilation to pressure support ventilation seven with PIP. And patient effort further increases after removal of PIP and further increases during a TPS trial. And TPS trial is the hardest spontaneous breathing trial in terms of a patient effort and work of breathing. But work of breathing does not decrease after extubation, and probably because it remains high resistance of upper airways. And therefore, patient effort during a TPS is exactly um, the same uh, work of breathing after extubation. Therefore, a pressure support ventilation trial is an easier test than TPS trial that may underestimate work of breathing needed after extubation and therefore may hasten extubation but may potentially increase the risk of extubation failure. We have several large-scale randomized control trials comparing uh, different types of uh, spontaneous breathing trials. The first one by Esteban in Spain was performed uh, 30 years ago. They compared 500 patients and they compared TPS trial and pressure support ventilation. The first result is that the proportion of patients who failed the first spontaneous breathing trial was higher with TPS because it's a harder trial as compared with uh, pressure support ventilation trial. Reintubation rates were exactly the same and the proportion of patients successfully extubated. In this study, patients extubated after one spontaneous breathing trial and not reintubated within the first 48 hours did not significantly differ. And therefore, <coughs> after this study, the two types of spontaneous breathing trials were considered as equivalent. But um, 20 years after, uh, a new Spanish randomized control trial, a large scale randomized control trial, including uh, more than 1,000 patients um, intubated more than 24 hours, uh, unselected patients, a high proportion of patients at low risk of extubation failure. And they compared a very hard trial, TPS trial for two hours, and pressure support ventilation trial for 30 minutes. What did they observe? Again, a higher proportion of patients succeeded the first spontaneous breathing trial with pressure support as compared with TPS. Reintubation rates were exactly the same and the proportion of patients successfully extubated, meaning after one spontaneous breathing trial and without reintubation within the first uh, 72 hours was significantly higher with pressure support than with a TPS trial. But my question after that was, is it true in patients at high risk of extubation failure? We designed this study uh, 
including patients at high risk of extubation failure, meaning with an age of more than 65 or with underlying chronic cardiac or respiratory disease. And uh, nearly 1,000 patients were randomized to undergo TPS trial or pressure support ventilation trial. And the hypothesis was that pressure support may hasten extubation without increased risk of uh, reintubation. For the primary outcome, the number of ventilator-free days at day um, uh, 28 did not significantly differ. And a posteriori, it was almost impossible to show a difference because a majority of patients were extubated after one spontaneous breathing trial and fortunately without reintubation. But again, and it is in previous studies, we found a higher proportion of patients succeeded the first spontaneous breathing trial with pressure support. A higher proportion of patients were extubated with simple winning during the first 24 hours after the spontaneous breathing trial. And a higher proportion of patients were extubated within the first seven days after the first uh, spontaneous breathing trial with pressure support as compared with TPS. This is illustrated by uh, this figure uh, showing uh, winning difficulties uh, shot by uh, Liz. Simple winning, difficult winning, prolonged winning, and with pressure support ventilation trial, a higher proportion of patients with simple winning and a lower proportion of patients with prolonged winning. Concerning reintubation rates, almost the same 14-15% as illustrated by uh, these Kaplan-Meier curves. Therefore, we have now three uh, uh, large-scale randomized control trials, and in these three studies, we observed a higher proportion of patients who uh, had simple winning, meaning extubated after one spontaneous breathing trial or within the first 24 hours after spontaneous breathing trials um, <clears throat> in the three studies. And uh, we have exactly the same uh, rate of reintubation, uh, although uh, assessment was different in terms of timing, 48 hours, 72 hours, seven days. But as you see, it's almost the same uh, rate of reintubation uh, in the two groups. Therefore, obviously, spontaneous breathing trials uh, still have a place, and I recommend rather using uh, pressure support ventilation eight without PIP than uh, using TPS, although I used TPS before our study, uh, because it's easier to perform uh, without disconnection, without uh, additional material, with uh, continuous monitoring of respiratory rate, tidal volume, and uh, it's easier to pass as compared with uh, TPS trial uh, and may hasten extubation without increased risk of reintubation, even in patients uh, considered at high risk of extubation failure. And above all, I, I think um, spontaneous breathing trials using pressure support favors the decision of uh, the Finnish physician. And uh, maybe spontaneous breathing trials is true, are not mandatory in patients, for example, uh, with a short duration of mechanical ventilation at low risk of extubation failure. But again, reintubation is a, a big problem, a, a, um, complication very serious, and uh, we don't have data showing that this strategy does not increase the risk of reintubation. And therefore, for the moment, even these patients, I, I think it uh, may be difficult to, to apply in, in all patients. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That was outstanding. Uh, questions from the floor? Uh, there's a hand up at the front here. While we're waiting for the mic, maybe I'll just ask you, do you still use T-piece in anyone? What? Do you still use the T-piece no. mode in any patient? No, no, no. I, I was, uh, I clearly changed my practice. Um, I saw the results from the Spanish study. We, uh, in our study, in our protocol used uh, TPs for all patients. It was our protocol, uh, spontaneous breathing trial, reusing TPs, and we changed. All the team uh, changed, and uh, and I, I think many uh, French ICUs also changed. Uh, um, it's uh, easy to have a, a high impact in his country. <laughs> 
and, and probably uh, this study has uh, changed uh, many ICUs in France because uh, the um, uh, 50 uh, percent of ICUs used TP trial. I, I don't know now, but uh, dis by discussing with uh, with colleagues, uh, many people have changed. But uh, again, uh, an important thing, and we discussed in, in Canada uh, in November, we applied uh, systematically, uh, almost systematically, non-invasive ventilation after extubation in these patients to prevent reintubation, but in both group, in all groups. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Anna, for this great talk. So, so you explained to us that patients that are reintubated have a higher mortality, right? But I think the important question here is, why do they have a higher mortality? Um, reintubation per se, prolongation of mechanical ventilation, new complications. Uh, but the question is, is, is it really reintubation per se? I mean, we don't lose that many patients during the reintubation itself, right? And I'm asking because. Probably not, but. Uh, the, if this is not the point, I mean, maybe it's just a marker of the severity of this. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. So, but if that is the case, why worry about a high reintubation rate if it's not related to the reintubation itself. Yes, but as you see, we can uh, accelerate, hasten the process in, in the, the same patients. And maybe uh, independently of the severity, we can accelerate the, and shorten the duration of mechanical ventilation without an increased risk. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult to assess severity because we, we use severity score, uh, PF ratio, et cetera, et cetera. But probably there are many factors very difficult to assess in clinical practice on muscles, uh, respiratory muscles. Uh, and, and I think it's very difficult to, 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 to compare severity of, of patients and we use trivial uh, parameters, uh, uh, SAPs, uh, et cetera, so far, but... Uh, the point is, I mean, a lot of studies show that reintubation rate is around 15%, and everyone says that more or less is acceptable, but maybe 30% is acceptable, right? Uh, the problem is 30%, uh, as mortality is uh, one third, it's probably a uh, uh, um, mortality of more than 10 or 50% in the population. And, and therefore, w when we observed uh, in all trials with a reintubation rate of 15%, the mortality, global mortality over our mortality is five, six, uh, less than 10%. And, and therefore, uh, when we observed uh, higher reintubation rates, usually we observe also uh, higher mortality. No, you are not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Arno, I have a question. Uh, during her talk, Liz Piquillou highlighted the fact that a substantial proportion of, of patients uh, in the, the study by Karen Burns, published in the JAMA, uh, had a direct uh, extubation without SBT. And you also mentioned that uh, and, and do you think it's possible to identify um, a profile of low-risk patients in whom it would not be mandatory to perform an, an SBT? Yeah, maybe in, in this study, patients were young with short duration of mechanical ventilation, maybe uh, less than 48, uh, 72 postoperative patients, patients without uh, cardiac disease, without uh, uh, chronic lung disease, uh, patients, uh, and maybe they were ventilated with low levels of pressure support, but it's difficult, it's uh, easier to extubate a patient with uh, uh, five centimeters of water of uh, pressure support and five of PIP and the direct uh, extubate this patient, for example, and, and we don't have all these informations, but uh, maybe these patients were at low risk and also ventilated with a low assistance, and, and therefore probably in this case, um, the usefulness of spontaneous breathing trial is probably not uh, very high. Uh, if uh, uh, if your patients, your probability is, uh, is uh, more uh, close to 100 percent to, to successful extubation, probably it's not uh, not so useful. We have time for one last question. Yeah, no, I just want to add to what Leo just said because I think it's a very, very important point. People who are reintubated compared to people who don't need to be reintubated are different patients. They're not the same. Are different patients. patients that need reintubation are different patients from patients who don't need reintubation. And that's why their mortality is higher. They are sicker patients, there's other, you know, confounders. And, and that's why, um, because we don't know whether reintubation in itself has attributable mortality, has mortality attached to the reintubation act,
almost no one dies during reintubation, during the act of reintubation. And that's why I think it's very hard to know what the optimum rate of reintubation is. And <coughs> essentially, the, the best test for extubation, the only best test for extubation, is extubation. No, I, I don't agree. I don't agree because, for example, you, you see, you tell that uh, we don't, uh, th these patients reintubated and those who did not require reintubation are, are, are not the same. No, it's wrong because we have other large randomized control trials, for example, uh, comparing non invasive ventilation, high flow, etc., prophylactic strategies, and we can find significant difference, decreased risk of reintubation, and this is the same patients. It's clinical trial, randomized control trial, and Spanish group and our study showed difference in reintubation rates in, uh, in this population, although uh, they are the same patient. Mortality was not different because um, uh, not designed for that. For example, in our study comparing non-invasive and high flow, we found a six difference um, um, in the risk of reintubation, but 3% of uh, difference of mortality. And probably we, we, we would need uh, um, a study including more than 2,000 patients to show a difference of mortality, maybe. And probably it was underpowered to see uh, such difference. I, I don't agree. We have several randomized controlled trials showing different risk of reintubation in the same population. And therefore, uh, I'm not sure of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm really sorry. Uh, we have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, at four, if you want, we can discuss. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. So this is my pleasure to, uh, and to uh, Leo Hanks from uh, Nijmegen uh, University. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And you'll see a couple of slides that you have seen before, but uh, maybe my interpretation is a little bit different. So let's see. So I was asked to talk about weanability or weaning eligibility criteria. I think it's an exciting, uh, exciting topic. So these are my disclosures, nothing really related to this presentation, I would say. And this is the typical trajectory of my ICU patients, right? Endotracheally intubated, maybe re-intubated, a period of controlled ventilation, longer or shorter, and at some point we switch to an assisted mode, and at some point, yes, we do a spontaneous breathing trial. And when it's successful, we might extubate the patient, and if he fails, we resume mechanical ventilation. And it's very important to realize that we lack a lot of evidence I mean, what is the best time to switch from control to assisted ventilation? We actually don't know. What's the best time to do a spontaneous breathing trial? But now we know at least how to do it. That is important. But I would like to focus on what is the best time to perform a spontaneous breathing trial. So this is from the document from the task force at, uh, from 27. And it's important that they defined the start of the weaning process as the first spontaneous breathing trial. I think if I would ask you or myself as a clinician, when does uh, weaning start? We would say much earlier, but for the rest of the talk, it's important to realize that weaning starts with the first spontaneous breathing trial. So why are we doing spontaneous breathing trials? I would say that a spontaneous breathing trial is a screening test, a screening test to identify patients potentially ready for extubation. And then the World Health Organization defined criteria for a screening test in general. It should only be done for diseases with serious consequences. Well, that's the case, right? Longer duration of mechanical ventilation has serious consequences. So yes, SBT could be a screening test. The test has benefits for the people's health. Yes, longer duration, unnecessary invasive ventilation has adverse effects. It must be reliable. We can discuss about that. But I don't think, well, I think we can agree that an SBT is not harmful in itself, right? And a screening test must be effective treatment when detected at an early stage. Yes, if the SBT is successful, we can extubate the patient. So I think 
and SBT more or less fulfills the criteria for a screening test. So back to this statement from 27, what are the weaning readiness criteria? What is here proposed as when should an SBT be performed? Well, when patients have an adequate cough, not too much tracheobronchial secretions, a hemodynamically stable, low dose of vasopressors, oxygenation, PF ratio higher than 150 at PEEP, equal to or below eight, and some more uh, parameters here. So you have already seen this trial, so I'm not going to uh, focus on the primary endpoint. But just to remind you, so these were patients 24 hours on the ventilator, randomized between 30 minutes of uh, pressure support aid or two hours of TP's trial. And these were the weaning eligibility criteria. This was when the SBT was performed, of course, resolution of the underlying condition. Hemodynamically stable, no dose, low dose vasopressors. Classical coma scale higher than 12, SpO2 below 90%, that's FeO2.4, respiratory rate below 35, and a maximum inspiratory pressure higher than 15. And then this is important. I think you briefly mentioned it already. The extubation after the first spontaneous breathing trial. So somewhere between 84 or 93% of the patients are extubated after the first SBT. So when you think about it, so we're doing a screening test, and the screening test is positive in 93% of your patients. Maybe then you don't have to do a screening test at all. The other study. So patients ventilated for more than 24 hours, higher risk of extubation failure, and as explained by Arno. Uh, pressure support aid versus the TPs. So these are the weaning eligibility criteria for this specific trial. Also respiratory rate below 35, PF rates show higher than 150, same as the JAMA study, adequate cuff, no continuous sedation and low or no dose of vasopressors. Also here, I mean, 78, 72% of the patients succeeded the first spontaneous breathing trial. I think, I don't have the answer, I can already tell you. But if we're doing a screening test that is positive in so many patients, maybe we should do it earlier. And then this is the Karen Burns study. Lisa showed some of the slides here as well. So it's an observational study, almost 1,900 patients invasively ventilated for more than 24 hours, and they wanted to characterize variations in weaning practices. Well, you've seen this slide three times, so I can go to it briefly. 62% of the patients, initial separation attempt was an SBT, and again, 82% of the patients were successful after the first SBT. Again, very high number. A little bit about the SBT practices. I think that's interesting as well. There's a huge variation around the globe. I mean, in the United States, the SBT was very popular, while in UK, Australia, and New Zealand, SBTs are conducted much less frequently. So, but this is my point, and I think this is something that we really need to discuss here. So the high rate of the first SBT success, maybe again for a screening test, would it be acceptable if just 50% of the patient fails or 60% of the patient fail? I mean, the SBT is not harmful in itself, I would think. And especially because of this, I mean, these are data about reintubation after unplanned extubation, it should say, I say SBT, but it's unplanned, extubation. So mostly self-extubation. If a patient experiences a self-extubation, so the patient tells you, I'm ready, I just extubate myself, only 50% needs to be reintubated. So maybe we were too late with our SBT. So I think this is something we have to think about. So to conclude this first part, I think the data have shown, at least Karen Burns' study, that there's a huge variation in weaning practices around the globe. 60% of the patients 
the first separation attempt is an SBT. And this is my personal opinion when going to the literature again, I think that SBTs are performed too late when we consider it as a screening test. So that was one of the reasons that we conducted this wean safe study to understand the weaning process in a really large real world population of ICU patients that were difficult to wean and difficult to wean was defined as being invasively ventilated for more than two days, at least at a higher risk of weaning failure. So these were the weaning eligibility criteria as we defined it. So FAO2 below, below 0.5, PEEP below 10, vasopressors at low dose. I think a lot of you in this room have contributed to the WeanSafe study. Again, thank you very much for that. It's a, it gives really a nice global picture of weaning practices around the globe. So what kind of patients were included? Typical ICU patients, 60 years of age, 40% women, a little bit overweight, BMI of 27, 23% of the patients with cardiopulmonary uh, past medical history, 22% diabetes, 14% smokers, and 22% of the patients being frail. And this, and Lisa showed it, and I think it's important to show it again. So realize, for all patients, being on the ventilator for more than two days, only 65% is successfully weaned after 90 days. In other words, the mortality for these patients is somewhere between 28 and 32%. Every time I see this picture, I think it's amazing. Only two days on the ventilator, this is your risk of mortality. I think it's a very important outcome. <laughs> So, like Karen Burns' study, we also found that the first separation attempt was an SBT in 66% of the patients, and it was conducted after a median of five days. 21% was direct extubation, and 14% had immediately a trach before the first SBT. So, right here also, 65% of our patients had a short wean, which means they were successfully extubated within 24 hours of the first separation attempt. Intermediate wean, which means between one and seven days, was 10% of the patients, and 10% of the patients were not successfully weaned one week after the first SBT. So this is important. And Lisa showed it, and I want to go into it a little bit more. And in the meantime, I had to think about Ewan's questions. I'm afraid he's going to ask me also. So, but what are the risk factors for delayed weaning? And what is delayed weaning? There's more than one day between reaching your weaning eligibility criteria, you know, PF, uh, no, sorry, FIO2, PEEP level, facial presses, and actually doing the SBT. The risk factors, frailty, trauma, neurological admission diagnosis, and as Lisa nicely explained, there are two modifiable factors using NMBA, before that of course, not during the SBT, before that, or moderate to high levels of sedation at the time of reaching weaning eligibility criteria. Secondly, what are risk factors for failed weaning, which means that you're not extubated or mostly you're dead 90 days after the first SBT, having a higher age, being immunocompromised, a, reason, a cardiac reason for admission, neurological reason for admission, but again, higher levels of sedation at the time of reaching the weaning eligibility criteria. So again, here, and that's important. There's two important modifiable factors, level of sedation, but also delaying the time of performing your first SBT. So you reach your winning eligibility criteria, but as a clinician, I don't do the SBT. That seems to be, no, it is associated with failed weaning. I mean, it's an observational study. I'm not sure if it's causative, but it's at least an association. <coughs> 
So I think what we learned from WeanSafe is that weaning success at day 90 in patients that are more than two days on the ventilator is only 65%. There are modifiable factors, and again, this is an observational study, cannot say it's causative, but there are factors that are potentially modifiable. And that's the delay between the presence of weaning eligibility criteria and performing your first SBT and the level of sedation. And this is my, uh, my final slide. So I think at least it is very important to define your weaning eligibility criteria. And I am really intrigued by the idea if the SBT is a screening test, we just accept a higher rate of failure. It's okay, you do another one tomorrow, while in the meantime, you try to improve conditions for the patients. So, and if the SBT is successfully extubated, and the only thing, if the patient fails, identify the underlying cause, so you have more success tomorrow. That's it, thank you very much. Uh, questions? So maybe I'll ask my question again, <laughs> uh, Leo. I mean, it's really thoughtful, but it's, you know, are these patients deeply sedated because they're, you know, intrinsically sicker, you know, to, to mention the same point you made about reintubation and mortality. Is there something different about these patients such that they require more sedation or have been exposed to more sedation? Well, are you, is this modifiable from your point of view? But I think the first point is, I mean, a lot of people would say that it's clear higher levels of sedation are associated with prolonged weaning, but the data are not that clear in the literature, right? There are some studies suggesting indeed that higher levels of sedation play a role in failed weaning, but there are other studies that don't show that. So I think it's, it's still a point of discussion in the literature. Honestly speaking, I don't think from our data we can say if their level of sedation was inappropriate. Um, I mean, it's my clinical gut feeling, but that's, I mean, it's not worth a cent, I'm, I'm sure. But I, I really think that levels of sedation are still too high, but I'm not sure if we can, can extract that from the data here. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you have any data or something to suggest it. I mean, it's, it's a clinical impression, but... No, I mean, I, the only reason I ask is because I think it's very, it's easy for us to look at that and say, oh, like, why aren't people waking their patients up? But I think, you know, part of it, at least we have to acknowledge, is there's a lot of complexity that underlies why a patient might have a low, right. you know, yeah. a level of arousal when it comes time for them to have their SPT. So I think it's very challenging, but I'm sure hopefully sure. at least part of it is modifiable. Right, yeah. Question at the back. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Jopion Kerr, University Hospital of Brussels. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, we know the reasons why extubation fails, it is neurological, respiratory, cardiac. However, in the criteria for extubation, this, it does not reflect. So do you think there's a place for more physiological parameters of the lung, for instance, uh, to be included for the reasons to extubate your patient? So you mean for the weaning eligibility criteria? I think, yes, if you look at the, at the Bowles paper, but also at, uh, at other papers where they included something like maximum, at least maximum inspiratory pressure, but not so much. I mean, it's something I'm really interested in, and I know that Ewan Golliger is very much interested in as, as well, is, is uh, a cough strength. I mean, Ewan did a very nice study with ultrasound to assess cough strength before extubation. I think you found that less thickening fraction of the expiratory muscles is associated with extubation failure. I mean, we had more or less similar findings and I, I very much agree with you. This should be taken into account. Well, no, it, I can't say it should be. I think there's a physiological rationale to take this into account as well. Yes. Okay. Sure. Question, question down at the front. This is probably the last question. The criteria you have said are soon, it's fine with that, uh, but uh, do you think that duration of mechanical ventilation has got something to do with those criteria? Somebody is ventilated for one or two or three days, 
may have this criteria adequate for winning. But someone who has been ventilated for three, four, five weeks may have this criteria, but they are not eligible for winning. Do you think that? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point. So the duration of mechanical ventilation at the time, taking into account the duration of mechanical ventilation and looking at weaning eligibility criteria. I think it's an important point, but my point remains the same. It doesn't matter as far as I know. There's no data to show that an SBT can harm the patient. I think I still think either if you have a short or longer duration of mechanical ventilation, try to do your SBT as soon as possible. And it's not a problem if the patient fails, I would think. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's now our pleasure to have Professor Frank Van Heron from uh, Sydney to present on inspiratory muscle training to treat patients with difficult weaning. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, as you can see, I'm collecting professorial titles, so if anyone has a university who needs another professor, just shoot me an email. Um, but um, I've got no relevant disclosures for this presentation. I think the discussion we had before is super interesting, and I'm going to add a little bit to that. Um, also, the introduction to my talk, the first couple of slides have now been already, I think, discussed a couple of times, so I might go through those first slides quite quickly. Um, so weaning is an issue because all intubated patients at some stage need to either come off the ventilator or die. Um, and, um, you know, we've seen that longer ventilation is associated with worse outcomes and with mortality. Um, you've seen this slide before, just to highlight again as a quick reminder that prolonged weaning is associated with increased mortality and increased resource utilization and longer length of stay in the wean study and the wean safe study. I think probably half the speakers are authors on the WeanSafe, and then pro probably everyone in the audience contributed to WeanSafe, I, I would have thought. Um, so you've seen this already before, more than 10,000 patients included. All I wanted to highlight again is that prolonged weaning um, is associated with worse outcomes, so higher mortality and higher length of stay. So it would be great if we could shorten the weaning process is the message. So when you look at failed weaning, um, there's a bit in terms of preventing, and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and then, you know, can we do something? Can we actively do something? Can we train our patients? Can we train their weak inspiratory muscles to get them off the ventilator? Or if they are already off the ventilator, can we still train their weak inspiratory muscles to improve their dyspnea, exercise tolerance, and quality of life? So. We've heard a lot about sedation already, um, ventilator settings and respiratory muscle weakness. You've seen this slide as well. Again, I'm going to go quite quickly to get to the point in terms of IMT. So um, a whole bunch of factors, as Leo also showed, are associated with failed weaning. Um, <laughs> you, you can't ask the same question again, Ewan, because it's already been asked whether deep sedation is really, truly modifiable. But, you know, there is a point there. When you deeply sedate patients, um, it's more likely you will, um, you know, th that their inspiratory muscles become weaker. So it is a factor that we should take into sedation in terms of waking them up and getting them on spontaneous ventilation. Now, this is a slide from really an excellent paper from the chair, uh, Ewan Golig in the Lancet a couple of years ago, and it sort of highlights that it's complicated. It is complicated. There's multiple challenges in mechanical ventilation and getting patients off the ventilator. And there's all these sort of uh, arrows in between the different factors there. Um, and one important point that I want to highlight is the muscle weakness that, um, that you get after you've been on the ventilator for a while. And that kicks in quite quickly. Um, it's a diaphragm and there's a whole entire session, I think, on diaphragmatic um, uh, weakness and injury tomorrow morning, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. But you know, even if you look at patients later on, six months later, um, one in three patients who have been on a ventilator for more than seven days have inspiratory muscle weakness and inspiratory muscle endurance problems. Part of, it is, part of this is the diaphragm, but it's probably also other muscles. And the diaphragm might be influenced by either over ventilation or under ventilation. And I think, again, um, 
a really important study done by the chair of the session. Um, I think this was really, it's really been a key study that, that unlocked a whole new area of research in terms of diaphrag diaphragmatic uh, weakness. Um, what, what Yoon showed was that, you know, already after a couple of days, and certainly after eight days, when you have excess inspiratory effort, so these patients are really trying very hard to breathe, you're not supporting them enough, then you get thickening of the diaphragm, but when you overventilate your patients, they get atrophy and weakening of the diaphragm. And does it have an impact on weaning? Yes, it does, because if you do get their diaphragmatic atrophy, you're much less likely to get off the ventilator. So it has an impact, this weakening of your inspiratory muscles. We know also uh, from this elegant study that looked at um, um, donation after brain death and donation after circulatory death patients and some controls, that if the diaphragm is not working for more than 100 hours, you get reduction in the fiber size of the muscles. It's just the same as when you're in bed and you're slowly atroph atrophying your muscles. It happens with your inspiratory muscles and your diaphragm as well. So there is a role in terms of how we set the ventilator, how deeply we sedate our patients, but that's not my talk. It's really about whether we can, once that's happened, once the patients are weak, whether we can do something about this. So what is IMT? What is inspiratory muscle training? Essentially, it is resistance during inspiration. So it's using a little device that makes it harder for the patient to, to breathe in. There's different types of devices. There is... Um, so very simple devices, and more recently, there have been a bunch of electronic devices that have a much bigger range, uh, which probably are going to be much more useful in patients uh, to train them. Um, and you can change that resistance, um, and then uh, if you use a threshold device that simply has a valve that opens uh, at a certain pressure threshold, and that's independent of flow, so it's the same every time the patient tries to do this. Now, the evidence for this comes from um, athletes, actually. So these are studies, some of these studies are done by the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, so rowers, um, when they are trained with IMT, they in improve their six minute all out effort. Um, they are quicker in the 5,000 meter time trial and they have uh, enhanced fatigue resistance. I don't think you can, from the back, uh, you can read the bottom line here. Similarly for runners, cyclists and swimmers, there's been a bunch of studies that looked at specific IMT tra training that improves um, outcomes in these, um, in these athletes. Um, so we know that it works, that we have to do that in a certain way, but also we need to do it over a certain period of time. It's like any training, you can't just do it once and think, you know, you can't just go for one run and think you can run a marathon, except Leo, but other people can't. Um, so you need to train and there's a duration of the training as well. And what the optimum duration for INT is, we're not too sure, but um, certainly you can already see an effect on the diaphragm after four weeks. But that's quite long, isn't it? So, endurance athletes are not ICU patients. Some of them become ICU patients, but um, where are the similarities and how could it help us? This is Bernie Bissett. She has been leading this program in Australia uh, for a couple of years. It was her PhD, um, and we worked together when I still worked in Canberra. Um, and she put this forward that there may be a trainability, you may be able to train your inspiratory muscles and your diaphragm, but you also put forward there might be psychological factors because the patient who's lying there being unable to get off the ventilator, if you can give them something to do, to train, you're actively going to train to, to get this tube out, that may be quite an important psychological uh, stimulus for that patient. So this is one of, um, of her RCTs, a small RCT. Uh, where we looked at IMT in patients who were on the ventilator. Um, and it was a small study only sort of, and that's, I have to say, that's the problem with the IMT literature at, at this point in time. All studies are very small uh, and we need bigger studies. We'll get to that later. Um, a small study that looked at uh, IMT versus control. Um, and there were a couple of interesting findings and a couple of disappointing findings. 
Interestingly, the quality of life and dyspnea improved in patients who had IMT, but there was no difference in the durational mechanical ventilation. Um, and there was also no difference in the pressure, the maximum inspiratory pressure that the patients could generate after having gone through the training, which is different from some of the other literature. Um, and trying to explain that, we've talked about this for a little bit, is um, one of the possible explanations is that this very simple device that we used in this study, not the electronic one, has a very limited range and patients quite quickly outperformed that range and we could no longer really retrain really them because they could very easily do what we wanted them to do. But there may be other factors as well um, that are um, implicated. This meta-analysis uh, where the chair was the senior author, uh, we did this together a couple of years ago and looked at 28 studies. All of these studies were small, 20 were RCTs. Um, and um, IMT was used ma mainly in patients who were difficult to wean off the ventilator, but some of them were done after extubation and some of them, it was unclear when it was done. So this, I think I stole this slide from you, Jürgen. Do you recognize it? Is it yours? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, just to highlight what I said earlier, the threshold devices you know, it's, it's a threshold valve and it opens once the patient has reached a certain pressure. And then it is, so it's the same every time the patient does it. There's also resistant, resistive devices and they are, um, I guess, um, influenced by the patient's effort and the flow the patient generates. So it's not a standardized way. So we believe that the threshold devices are the ones to use. So what did the meta-analysis show? Um, Generally, all these studies showed an improvement in the, in the inspiratory muscle, so maximum inspiratory pressure improved. Um, and I'll get... Um, there was a reduction in duration of ventilation, but the problem with these pooled estimates was that, well, first of all, there were a whole bunch of studies with a very high risk of bias, I remember. And when these patients were taken out of this particular analysis, um, it was no longer significant. Um, there was also uh, an effect on weaning when the bad studies were taken out. This effect was still significant, but I think we all agreed that the pooled estimate, the confidence in these estimates, estimates was pretty low or moderate because there was just such a significant heterogeneity in the studies, in the methodologies, in the statistical analysis of these studies. So. For my point, this would be hypothesis generating. This is not hard evidence that IMT works in our patients. So we definitely need, need more evidence. Um, in this meta-analysis, um, the goal was to look whether IMT added to just physiotherapy or early mobilization has an additive effect. And in this meta-analysis, what they show is that IMT added to conventional physical therapy still has an additional effect on weaning duration. There's still a signal that IMT might be um, additive. So this is IMT when you're on the ventilator. But then there's a bunch of studies that look at IMT once you're off the ventilator, sort of an early rehab or, or training. Again, Bernie Bissett did one of the early studies where she showed that once patients are off the ventilator and you give them IMT, their maximum inspiratory pressure improves so you can actually train these muscles. Um, and these patients felt a lot better. Their quality of life, as measured by validated scales for quality of life, improved. A recent study, COVID, uh, patients who were weaned after having been intubated for COVID. Again, a small study, but very similar outcomes. When you do IMT after you've been extubated, you improve some of the lung function tests, you improve um, your endurance and your fatigability and your quality of life. Um, this is just something I just um, added just out of interest. I wasn't aware of this study until I looked recently. Um, IMT pre or post cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting. So a meta-analysis looking at outcomes such as pneumonia, 
and atelectasis, and it appears that if you train these patients either before they have their surgery or after, there is an improvement in these outcomes. I'm just going to skip this one quickly. Um, so, where are we going? Clearly, we need more data. Uh, we need more larger studies. Um, and we're working on something in Australia, and I understand Ewan is working on something as well, and hopefully we can collaborate on something in the, going into the future. Um, we're preparing an, a multi-center a phase three trial where we are looking at a six weeks intervention, both on the ventilator and after extubation to look at whether we can improve relevant patient outcomes. The first step of that was <coughs> to validate this electronic device that we're going to use in the study, this has just been published, and the participants, the patients, really um, liked that electronic device. They really uh, tolerated it well and felt less breathless after having used it. If you want to know how to do it, um, we've published a, a multidisciplinary guide a couple of years ago with some patient selection criteria. You can find it in a publication. <clears throat> Your patients need to be alert and cooperative, otherwise you can't do it. Um, and this is how we do it, five sets of six breaths, once per day. Um, and I'm just going to show you a very quick movie with Bernie Bissett, how she does it. So this is a patient, she gave us permission to show this. So that is a simple device, and she takes six breaths. And you hear Bernie. Oh, that was beautiful. Five, one more. Excellent, well done. That was better than the last set. <laughs> Excellent. So, in conclusion, respiratory weakness, uh, muscle weakness is common. Um, inspiratory muscle weakness, expiratory common, uh, muscle weakness is common as well. It's a separate talk um, and affects probably cough. Um, it has significant implications. We think we can train these muscles again by using inspiratory muscle training. It's definitely safe, safe and feasible. Um, the data suggests that you can actually train these muscles, that the muscle strength improves, um, and it is associated with some improved outcomes. But again, the confidence of that is at the moment still fairly low. Small studies, heterogeneity, but larger studies are on their way. So thanks very much. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, there's a question down here near the front. Hi, thank you very much, great talk. Um, this is a really practical question. Um, I'm assuming when you use the power brief device, the electronic devices, that they're used, it's, it's one device used for many patients. So how can you ensure the sort of infection control safety of them? Yeah, good question. So we would use a different device for each, each patient. Okay. That is with the uh, simple one. The electronic one, they come with um, connectors that you can take off, you can clean it, and then you can take the device to the next patient. Other questions? How do you select, do you do, you do this clinically in any, any of your patients? Um, the answer is sometimes, <laughs> because I think we still, um, I think we still need better data. Um, and in our institution, the physiotherapists run this, um, and um, the patients are selected, uh, as I described in, uh, in that sort of um, that guideline paper. Um, there are patients who are on the ventilator for a while, um, ideally you know, more than seven days, five to seven days. Those are the patients we think are really going to be um, benefiting from a bit of, bit of training. But they need to be stable, they need to be hemodynamically stable. I mean, there's a bunch of criteria that I've shown very briefly on that one slide and that you can find in that paper. Um, I think that's still one of the questions, which patients would benefit most. Um, but my gut feeling would be the patients have to, that have been on the ventilator uh, for longer. 
um, and especially patients who've been on a controlled mode of ventilation longer, where these, these you know, these, that muscle weakness kicks in very, very quickly, as, as you've uh, shown us. Mm. Great. Thank you very much. We have, I think that you have answered a question. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed that. Go ahead. So, Frank, I, I, thank you for this great talk. I have a physiological question. I mean, breathing is an endurance task, right? So why would it make sense to introduce strength training? Why wouldn't you focus on endurance training? Yeah. Good question for uh, expected from a marathon runner. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, there are, IMT can be both, uh, and I've, I've sort of glossed over that. But in, the, in Ewan's meta-analysis, you'll see that we divided the studies into strength um, regiments and endurance regiments. So you can do IMT more as an endurance one or more as a strength intervention. It's just a slightly different way of doing it um, in terms of what, what target, so high intensity, what target of the maximum inspiratory pressure you use and how often you repeat it. Um, both these um, methods um, improve MIP and have similar outcomes in terms of. So um, I'm not sure whether one would be better than the other. I, I, I tend to agree with you that it's that we need endurance, but we also need strength, right? I mean, you also need um, um, when I when your own sort of um, topic, uh, expiratory uh, muscle weakness, and you need these muscles to cough. That's that's also both strength and endurance. Coughing is a strength task, right? You need to generate a lot of pressure in a short time period. Yeah. So I was always always wondering, what is the effect of IMT? Is it really increase in muscle mass, or does it have to do with re innervation of muscles? I mean, but maybe that's too long of a discussion right now. But it, it is, and I again I glossed over a paper that looked at um, some of the oxygenation parameters. So Rick Hosling did a, did a study, his group looking at sternocleidomastoid muscles and other muscles, and if you do high intensity. IMT, there is oxygenation improvements in these muscles during exercise. So it's much more than just thickening of the muscle. There's also um, training. And, um, and, and interestingly, most IMT studies that looked at expiratory strength also showed that the maximum expiratory pressure improves in these patients. So there's much more going on than just a bit of yeah, sniffing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Oriol Roca from uh, Barcelona, to give his talk on uh, post extubation respiratory care. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to focus a little bit on the other part of the equation because the way that you do an SBT or when you decide to extubate is only part of the success. The other part is how do you support your patient after extubation? Because if you do nothing, probably the reintubation rates that all the previous speakers have been shown will rise a little bit. These are my conflicts of interest. And, and the first question is, why do we need post-extubation support? And this meta-analysis was not planned to show that, but I only want to point out something that has been already said, okay. which is that when you extubate the patient, the work of breathing is much higher than when the patient is intubated, and even much higher than uh, when you are doing an SBT, even though we try to decrease this work of breathing, trying to simulate the work of breathing that the patient needs to breathe without any kind of support in order to know if this patient would be able to support this work of breathing and we will, will not need to reintubate the patient. So the aim of, uh, of uh, providing post-extubation respiratory support is trying to decrease the rate of intubation but also extubation, extubate the patient a little bit earlier. I agree with Leo that we could decrease the or, or, or try to make an SBT 
earlier. In fact, is what we did in our last paper in ICM, comparing two strategies uh, of, of not only of SVT, but also of uh, criteria to start to win the patient. And the problem is that one size, as usual in critical care, does not fit all. These are my family. And we were ready for an adventure ride and we had our own bikes, but my little kid has a small bike and I have a bigger bike. Probably if we change the bikes, all of us will fall down in less than one second. So the issue here is to choose the right bike for the bike rider. And what are the guidelines say? The guidelines say, do what you can, because the, the recommendations were always conditional. If you have a patient that has been intubated for more than 24 hours, then try with high flow, which is better than conventional oxygen. But if you think that the patient would be better with NIV, use NIV. So at the end is clinical judgment, nothing more than that. And which patients would benefit potentially from NIV? So COPD, obese, hypercamnic, I'm sure that all of you if I ask without showing this list, I'm sure that all of you will, 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 will put the same type of patients here. Uh, and something that I'm sure that I know we talk later on is about what happens if the patient develops acute respiratory failure after extubation, because we can use this post-extubation respiratory support as a preventive therapy or we can use also if the patient develops acute respiratory failure after extubation. What about prevention? This is probably one of the first study uh, that was published by Gonzalo Hernandez almost 10 years ago in JEMA. Uh, he compared high flow versus conventional oxygen in patients with low risk of intubation, which means that they had no risk factor for reintubation, and high flow performs better in terms of need for reintubation after 20, uh, 72 hours. And when we look at patients at high risk, that was a was defined as the presence of at least one risk factor for reintubation, NIV was more or less like high flow. But we were a little bit concerned about this result because we put in the same box patients with one risk factor for reintubation and seven risk factors for reintubation, which was a pragmatic approach, but it does really does not make a lot of sense. So we made a postdoc analysis of this paper and we saw that some kind of threshold at between three and four risk factors. It seems that if you have more than four risk factors, at high flow increase the risk for reintubation compared with an IV. And then we plan another study comparing this specific subset of patients with more than four risk factors for reintubation. And as you can see, the reintubation rate was lower with NIV as well as the length of hospital stay. But importantly, look at the time of NIV use during the first and the second day because it was protocolized. They need to be on NIV at least the first 48 hours after extubation. They were almost all day with NIV. In that case, when, there were, when they were uh, without NIV, they were treated with conventional oxygen. And the group of Arnott improved the strategy and compare high flow with high flow plus NIV, which makes a lot of sense. And they observed that this combination in patients with, sorry, in patients who had uh, 
more than 65 years old or had any underlying chronic or cardiac or lung disease, high flow plus NIV decreased the rate of reintubation compared with high flow alone. But if you look at the uh, subgroup analysis, it seems that even though there is a still a difference, the, the main result of the study was driven by the patients who were hypercamnic, which is something that we could expect before. He also did a, a, a secondary analysis uh, um, focusing on patients who were, who were obese. And as you can see in, that, in, in these patients, as we expected before, just because the, 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 the um, underlying process that caused the winning failure, NIV performs better than high flow. It's quite... Uh, I mean, we could assume that these patients would benefit more than pressure than, than flow. And the study was more or less repeated by the group of Samir Javert, uh, but they compare NIV against conventional oxygen. And regardless, the subgroup of patients that you see, NIV perform better than high flow in obese, than conventional oxygen in obese uh, patients. What happened with neurological patients, we have, been, we have seen that they are a very specific population and using this Bayesian approach, the prophylactic use of high flow or NIV was not associated with a decrease of reintubation. So probably the cause of winning failure of this patient is completely different to the ones that I have shown before. This is a study that I like a lot. It, it was performed by the group of uh, John Cassie and, and, and Matt Sembler in, in Nashville. Uh, they have a pragmatic group of randomized control trials and what they did is they compare usual care with what we sh should do, which is the patient who would benefit from high flow, we treat with high flow, and the patient who would benefit with NIV, we treat with NIV. And they, fortunately, they, had, they found no difference in the rate of reintubation. But again, probably the time of uh, post-extubation support was not so high. And another thing that we have to keep in mind is that the patients who at the end, regardless of the group that they were, receive any kind of post-extubation respiratory support was completely different from the, from the group of uh, patients who did not receive any kind of post-extubation respiratory support, which means that some patients for sure would benefit from the post-extubation respiratory support that they would be better for them. And finally, at the top of the evidence, there's always some meta-analysis. And this was a network meta-analysis that uh, uh, I'm sure that Ewan that has performed uh, uh, some of them um, knows better than me how to explain, but with the network meta-analysis, you are able to compare even strategies that has not been compared specifically in a randomized control trial by themselves. And the message of the meta-analysis is more or less what we have seen in all the trials. Compared with conventional oxygen, high flow NIB decrease the rate of reintubation. Again, there is no effect of mortality, probably because they, don't, they do not die because of the reintubation. Reintubation is a consequence and then a lot of things happen and finally the patient die. And one interesting thing is that the highest the baseline risk of reintubation is, the more benefit you get from any kind of post-extubation respiratory support. And the highest risk, baseline risk for reintubation, the better performs the combination that are not proposed in the, in, the, in the JAMA study combining high flow and, and, and NIV. What about treatment? Uh, this is the paper from Andres Esteban that it's almost 20 years ago. 
where they include moderate to severe ARDS comparing NIV versus conventional oxygen. The mortality of NIV was higher compared to conventional oxygen, and maybe we can later see some hypotheses to explain why it happened. This is the RENO trial. It's, it's, uh, it was performed in Italy and, and France and, and, and other units, and the trial was negative because the main outcome was the reintubation rate, and they compare high flow against conventional oxygen in patients with mild acute respiratory failure. It was negative because the outcome was reintubation. But look what happens to the rate of NIV use. Patients treated with conventional oxygen needed more frequently to escalate the treatment to NIV. So at the end, we, they were not comparing, in terms of reintubation, conventional oxygen against high flow, because it was an IV in the middle. And this is another uh, postdoc analysis of, of, of the group of Arnott. And on the left part of the slide, you can see the difference between the study by Andres Esteban and the study by Arnott. And the difference were clear in terms of the median time to endotracheal intubation, which was 12 days in the group of, in the study by Andres Esteban, which may at least partially explain the increase in mortality in the group of, of, of NIV. And that time they do not compare NIV against conventional oxygen, they compare high uh, NIV against the use of high flow. Uh, I will skip it because I'm thinking that I'm running out of time. So the only thing that I'm sure that I don't know with, with, with address in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, talk is if we, use, if we need to use rescue NIV uh, to prevent reintubation. And the results of the meta-analysis say that there is no benefit on doing that. And there is a risk of delaying intubation or delaying reintubation, which is not, uh, uh, which, we, which we should keep in mind every time that we use it. And this is my final slide, the, 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 the study by, by Gavin Perkins that compare early NIV without an SVT that has been already discussed. And there was a trend or more reintubation when you use early NIV without any SVT, despite other potential uh, benefits. And I agree with all the previous speakers that, uh, speakers that uh, SVT should be used. In summary, extubation failure is, is complex. And we need to identify the, the cause of failure. Otherwise, we will not provide, we will not correct, and we will not provide the correct treatment to the patient in order to solve this problem that has occasioned the extubation failure. And probably combining, as Arnaud did in his trial, some post-extubation respiratory support, non-invasive therapies may be a good way to start to address this difficult situation. Thank you very much, and I will be very happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Questions from, from the floor? Okay, so, so <clears throat> to uh, like make, make things simple, you say one size does not fit all, but if we consider uh, patient at high risk of post-extubation acute respiratory failure as a prophylaxis, what would you recommend? I, I think that a pragmatic approach, which might not be the best, if you are not obese and you are not hypercamnic and you are not on prolonged mechanical ventilation, which then I would choose for NIV, and according to the number of risk factors apart from that that you have, if you have less than four, maybe high flow is enough. 
If you have more than four, I think that you would benefit from NIV. And this is a simple approach, and you only have to look at how many risk factors you have. And regarding the combination of high flow and non-invasive? For sure. If, if you use NIV, in between sessions of NIV, I would think that high flow is much better than conventional oxygen. Thank you. Questions? Great. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, for the final uh, lecture of our uh, session this afternoon, invite Professor Tilly back to the podium to discuss extubation failure management. Thank you. Maybe you would have uh, preferred another speaker for, to finish the session, but I am not in charge of the program, and therefore I have a second session in. Uh, um, my name is Arnaud Thiel. I work at the University Hospital of Poitiers in France, and uh, the talk uh, this time concerns uh, extubation failure, and maybe we will see many results we, we saw in, in previous uh, um, presentations. These are my conflicts of interest, mainly with uh, Fisher and Paykel. Extubation failure is, in my opinion, uh, could be defined as reintubation, and uh, as we saw before, usual rates of reintubation are around 15%, but mortality in case of reintubation is particularly high, and I really think that uh, this is the main patient-centered outcome after extubation and could be the definition for um, extubation failure. But when, when to assess reintubation? Many studies assess reintubation at 48 hours, 72 hours, maybe until seven, seven days after spontaneous um, extubation. Um, I strongly believe that we, we would assess reintubation maybe until day seven. And in this study, when we compared prophylactic strategies after extubation, non-invasive ventilation versus high flow and non-invasive ventilation, we found a, a decreased risk of reintubation using NIV. But we use in this study as primary outcome reintubation at day seven. And among all patients who require reintubation in the ICU, 97% of them were reintubated within the first seven days after extubation. But for example, at 48 hours, only 60% of patients who needed reintubation in the ICU were reintubated within the first 48 hours after extubation, and probably it's too early to assess reintubation at 48 hours and even at 72 hours. And in my opinion, extubation failure should be uh, clearly defined and, uh, and probably uh, reintubation or death in case of do not reintubate order uh, within the seven days following extubation could be an adequate uh, definition of extubation failure. Who are the patients at risk. We, we discussed uh, this point just before. In uh, our study, we used this criteria defined in a previous observational study, um, and we used this uh, very easy criteria to identify because we know all these criteria at time of extubation. An age of more than 65, underlying chronic cardiac disease, meaning uh, ischemic cardiopathy, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, regardless of the reason, uh, history of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, atrial fibrillation, or underlying chronic um, respiratory disease, including mainly COPD patients, but also, and more and more frequent, uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome. And these patients in observational studies before um, systematic use of non-invasive ventilation, high flow, etc., high reintubation rates above 20 or 25 percent. And these patients were clearly easy to identify this population with a high risk of reintubation. But in the Spanish study, they used other criteria, the same age, uh, cardiac disease, respiratory disease, but also uh, obesity, comorbidities, uh, prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, winning difficulties, difficulty to manage secretions. Um, maybe a, just a little bit difficult to calculate, for example, severity score, but uh, okay. Um, I, I would like to just to discuss about obesity. It's not really a risk factor for extubation failure. 
And in this recent uh, uh, systematic review, they um, analyzed all risk factors for extubation failure. And by contrast, they found that obese patients had a decreased risk of reintubation, not an increased risk of reintubation. Why? Probably because these patients are very good responders to positive pressure, CPAP, or non-invasive ventilation. And in this postdoc analysis of our study comparing NIV and high flow, <coughs> sorry, we found that non-invasive ventilation did not decrease the risk of reintubation in patients with a BMI below a 25. By contrast, in patients not obese but overweight or obese, had a, a marked reduction in the risk of reintubation rate. And just to uh, stop a moment, the, in obese patients, the rate of reintubation was only 6%. 6% assess as day 7, therefore late after extubation. In patients with also other criteria for extubation failure, chronic cardiac disease or chronic respiratory disease or age, and their weight of reintubation was only 6%. And therefore, sh showing that these patients had not an increased risk, but probably a lower risk, especially when applying non-invasive ventilation and positive pressure. Difficulty to manage secretion, probably a very high uh, risk factor as discussed in the, in the um, um, uh, presentation with uh, neurological patients. And when we analyze the reintubation rates in patients with uh, ineffective cough or moderate or effective cough in this study, observational study including patients at high risk of extubation failure, we uh, observed reintubation rates up to 40%, a very high rate of reintubation. In this study, we assessed uh, cough strengths using a semi-quantitative uh, uh, scale, absent, weak, uh, ineffective, moderate, etc., etc., uh, assessed by nurses at bedside. And um, is it a good method to assess the cough strengths? Yes, probably. In this systematic review, uh, they pulled more than 7,000 uh, patients, and they found that uh, as well, cough peak flow or semi-quantitative cough strength score was effective to assess and to detect patients with ineffective cough. And in both groups, they found reintubation rates so high as 35 or 40 percent, exactly as our uh, previous study. So, how to prevent extubation failure and reintubation? Maybe by performing heart spontaneous breathing trial, and we discussed this point in the previous presentation because pressure support ventilation trial is an easy trial, whereas um, TPS trial is a hard trial in terms of rocker breathing. But we have two recent studies patients, more than 1,000 patients in, patient, um, in patients at low risk of extubation failure. Reintubation rates were exactly the same with pressure support ventilation trial or TPS trial. And in our study, including nearly 1,000 patients at high risk of extubation failure, assessed at day seven, almost the same 15 and 14 percent of reintubation in both groups. Therefore, a hard trial does not seem to reduce the risk of extubation failure. <coughs> How to prevent extubation failure, maybe by performing alveolar recruitment before extubation. Because in this Spanish study, they found that reconnection to uh, the ventilator for one hour before extubation significantly decreased the risk of reintubation, 14 to 5 percent. Just uh, in these patients, most of them um, underweight spontaneous breathing trials using TPS trial, probably a um, trial promoting a large alveolar recruitment. And in this physiological study just published uh, this month, we compared loss of end expiratory lung volume after a spontaneous breathing trial performed with pressure support or with spontaneous with, uh, TPS trial, and what happened after one hour of reconnection. 
and we found a loss of volume around 20% with a pressure support ventilation trial, but more than 40% using a TPS trial, a marked derecruitment, a marked loss of end expiratory lung volume at the end of spontaneous breathing trial that may explain, in case of direct extubation without reconnection, an increased risk of post-extubation respiratory failure and maybe reintubation. We can observe that one hour after reconnection to ventilator, um, loss of volume was completely recovered as at uh, baseline. But uh, almost uh, 10 minutes after reconnection, we recovered almost all volumes also. How to prevent extubation failure? We discussed this point also before, maybe by applying prophylactic non-invasive respiratory support. These uh, are the most recent uh, clinical practice guidelines and uh, suggesting the use of high flow nasal oxygen in patients, hypoxemic patients at low risk of extubation failure with a low certainty of evidence and the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients uh, considered at high risk of extubation failure with a moderate certainty of evidence. Why a low certainty of evidence for high flow nasal oxygen? Probably because we have two large scale randomized control trials with contradictory results. The first one for Spain by Gonzalo Hernandez, showing that high flow nasal oxygen was associated with a decreased risk of reintubation as compared with standard oxygen. And another study from Italy showing similar reintubation rates with high flow nasal oxygen or standard oxygen, although non invasive ventilation as rescue was a little bit less used in the high flow group. Uh, finally, reintubation rates were exactly the same in both groups. Concerning patients at high risk of extubation failure, we uh, published this study uh, many years ago more than 600 patients at high risk of extubation failure, and we compared high flow nasal oxygen alone or high flow nasal oxygen plus alternating with non-invasive ventilation. We found a significant decreased risk of reintubation, exactly the rates planned by the study, 18%, 12% in, uh, in patients treated with non-invasive ventilation. Another study from Spain, uh, again, Gonzalo Hernandez, or your worker, um, showing that in patients at high risk, using their definition, uh, several criteria for, to consider patients at high risk, and they found a significant decreased risk of reintubation again with non-invasive ventilation as compared with high flow nasal oxygen. How to treat now, how to treat respiratory failure, post-extubation respiratory failure. Ariel showed this uh, slide uh, in the previous presentation. This is a very important study published uh, nearly 20 years ago. They randomized patients with post-extubation respiratory failure to receive non-invasive ventilation or standard oxygen. They found exactly the same rate of reintubation, half of patients, but mortality was significantly higher with NIV than with uh, standard oxygen. May why? Maybe because patients were reintubated uh, later than the others. This is a very important study because in the success story of non-invasive ventilation showing beneficial effects in COPD patients, cardiogenic pulmonary edema in 90s, and then some forms of acute respiratory failure, this was the first the first study showing that non-invasive ventilation may have deleterious effects in patients, may, have, uh, may be associated with an increased risk of, of death. I remember in a uh, European Congress, everybody uh, looked for all reasons to explain because they had little experience, uh, blah, blah, I don't know, but we had, these patients are really dead. And, and it was the first data showing a potential deleterious effect. And therefore, uh, most recent uh, guidelines uh, suggest that non-invasive ventilation should not be used in the treatment of patients with established post extubation respiratory failure. Problem is, what uh, can we use? Because non-invasive ventilation 
um, may be associated with an increased risk of death, and high flow nasal oxygen has never been specifically studied in, in this situation, in this setting. In the postdoc analysis of our uh, JAMA study, we found that uh, patients uh, were treated with non-invasive ventilation in uh, more or less 40% of cases, and, and we found a, a trend for better outcomes with non-invasive ventilation. We, um, the conclusion was just non-invasive ventilation may not be deleterious in, in this setting. But therefore, we conducted and we designed a new study comparing uh, non-invasive ventilation alternating with high flow or high flow alone only in patients with criteria for, for post-extubation respiratory failure. And uh, this study started uh, just uh, last year. We used uh, I, we use our as, um, criteria for reintubation, obviously cardiac respiratory arrest, altered consciousness, and severe respiratory failure, including two criteria among a high respiratory rate, above 35, clinical signs suggesting respiratory stress, respiratory acidosis with a pH below 7.25, or severe hypoxemia with a pH ratio below 100 millimeters of mercury. In conclusions, a heart spontaneous breathing trial using TPs does not seem to reduce the risk of reintubation. A reconnection to mechanical ventilation may prevent a reintubation, probably by avoiding uh, a pronounced alveolar de recruitment induced, especially by TPs trial. And non invasive ventilatory support uh, can prevent reintubation. Uh, especially in patients at high risk of extubation failure. And uh, I uh, keep this slide for summarizing the, the different situation of patients at, at low risk to prevent, at high risk, or uh, to treat post-extubation respiratory failure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Discussion? Um, may, I'm really fascinated by the new data that uh, you and Remy Coudois uh, published in, in CHEST. Uh, what does this suggest about the importance of vocal cord function after extubation to maintain lung volume? Like vocal, vocal cord function, like, or like it strikes me that this issue of lung volume and maintaining lung volume before and after extubation seems important to the outcome. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on the issue of vocal cord function after extubation? as a mechanism of, of uh, extubation failure. Yes, but uh, you, you refer uh, with, uh, with which data? Uh, for, for the, uh, the, the study looking at lung volume? Yes, but wh why vocal cord? Uh, what is the relation between, uh, excuse me, I don't understand the, the relation between the loss of volume and the... <laughs> no, fair enough, I'm jumping steps ahead. But one of the, re one of the mechanisms by which we maintain lung volume after extubation is vocal cord function. And it seems that the lung volume is quite different between pressure support and T piece. Or maybe so, just a pressure, no? Well, maybe sure. your pressure allows uh, alveolar recruitment. And, uh, but I, I don't know if it's uh, the only mechanism to explain a post extubation respiratory failure, but we know that uh, fatigue. Uh, does not seem to exist. And in the uh, old paper by Franco Laghi, uh, fatigue of the diaphragm does not exist in case of uh, um, spontaneous breathing trial failure. Patients had a higher work of breathing at the beginning, at the end, but uh, diaphragm function remained uh, uh, adequate. And, uh, and therefore, it could be a mechanism to explain a post extubation respiratory failure, this loss of uh, uh, um, volume due to uh, um, removal of pressure, just removal of pressure. And it could explain also beneficial effects of apply uh, CPAP or non invasive ventilation af after. Very good, thank you. I think if there's no further discussion, then we can wrap things up. Thank you to Professor Thiele and all our tremendous speakers this afternoon and audience engagement, great questions and discussion. And uh, extremely well chaired by Professor Dumoul as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.